We've got Brother Sean Moynihan. He will be presenting to us Mary, the warrior mom. With that, I'll give you Sean. Just do a quick sound check. Can people hear me in the back? Yep. So this is a quote. Um, some folks asked me, I read it in the last class. People asked me to, to, uh, to source it, so there it is. Um, I think we have to be uh, thoughtful about using all non-Christelphian sources. And I think my experience in researching Mary even more so, because in, in many of the sources I would be reading and thinking, yeah, that's, that makes sense, that's awesome, that's great. Whoa, that went off the rails pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so, but there's the source for people that were, um, were wondering about that. Okay, Mary the warrior mom. John Thomas writes in Alpha Israel that God instituted war when he put enmity between the serpent and the woman. And Mary is ready to go back to Nazareth. Her time with Elizabeth has prepared her for the many battles that she is about to face. Mary is ready to face enemies in Nazareth and beyond. The uh, science fiction writer N.K. Jemisin writes, there is no greater warrior than a mother protecting her child. And we know that biblically speaking, that is exactly the same idea. We read in 2 Samuel 17, you know that your father and his followers are real warriors. How do you know that? They are as fierce as a mother bear whose cubs have just been killed. And the Greco-Roman world that authors like Luke were writing for appreciated the strength of mothers, especially when it came to war. You folks have heard of the Battle of Thermopylae, the hot gates, where 300 Spartans withstood the face of the Persian Empire. Uh, the Spartan king, Leonidas, um, this is how he decided on the 300. Stephen Pressfield writes, Leonidas picked the men he did, he explains, not for their warrior prowess as individuals or collectively. He could have easily selected 300 others or 20 groups of 300 others, and they all would have fought bravely into the death. That was what Spartans were raised to do. Such an act was the apex to them of warrior honor. But the king didn't pick his 300 champions for that quality. He picked them instead for the courage of their women. He chose these specific warriors for the strength of their wives and mothers to bear up under their loss. See, Mary was like those Spartan women. She had to bear up under the loss of Jesus, which she would uh, come to understand, as we'll see in the next few classes. And we don't know how long she lived, but even uh, one of her other children, James, was killed by the rulers in 62 AD. So we don't know how long Mary lived, but if she had uh, a long life, she would have seen her other son also killed by the authorities. So Mary is a warrior mom. Now, we know how strongly connected Mary is to folks like Deborah. We know that Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country of Judea, echoing Deborah in Judges 5. <coughs> Excuse me. There were no warriors in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose to be a mother in Israel. That's from the, the New Century Version. From the New English Translation, warriors were scarce. They were scarce in Israel until you arose, Deborah, until you arose as a motherly protector in Israel. And Robin Branch writes in Bible History, Deborah calls herself a mother in Israel, probably one of the highest designations in scripture. It indicates authority. So we know what Mary's war is generally, but specifically, she wanted a home for her son to grow and develop into a godly man ready to assume David's throne. And she wanted safety for her son, born king of the Jews against a ruthless and paranoid ruler, of course, Herod. So let's take a look at those two things. She wanted a home for her son to grow and develop into a godly man ready to assume David's throne. As she made her way back to Nazareth, she was dealing with the reality of a family who might not accept the reality of Jesus' parentage. 
should be dealing with a community who would marginalize Jesus because of the gossip surrounding his birth. And like Hannah, Mary wanted her son, whom she dedicated to God, to grow in stature and in favor both with Lord and men. And we'll see that she's successful in that part of her battle. She also wanted safety for her son against Herod. Now, Caesar Augustus famously said, it is better to be, Caesar, or better to be Herod's pig than his son. Now, the reason for that is uh, Herod was known to be a, a highly observant Jew who would never think of murdering a pig. But if you're one of Herod's relatives, all bets were off. So Herod, in fact, not only killed his wife, he killed his mother-in-law, uh, and he killed all of his sons because he was so paranoid about someone usurping his throne. And Paul writes about this kind of... Um, you know, evil rulership in, in uh, Ephesians 6, where our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spir spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So, Mary, as a warrior mom, has her work cut out for her with a very powerful adversary. So, Mary returns to Nazareth from Elizabeth's home. She's three months away from home. We can infer that Mary returned after John was born. We can infer that Mary was visibly pregnant upon her return. So the scene of the battle is now enjoined in Nazareth. Why do we think of Mary as a warrior mother? Well, we talked about the allusions to Deborah. There are the allusions to jail, which we've talked about and then we'll briefly referred to in a sec. The only two women referred to as blessed among women. There are allusions throughout um, Mary's life to the people in the Old Testament, the women that acted with Kael. This word Kael is a very, very important word. It's a word that uh, typifies the virtuous woman. It's a word that typifies Ruth. Uh, as we'll see, it's a very, very powerful word. And it's a word that we don't really understand because translated, um, it's been translated in different ways depending upon whether it refers to a man or a woman. So we're gonna see that Kyle, when it's referring to a man, is usually translated valor. When it's um, referring to a woman, it's usually translated virtue, but it's the same word. Mary receives a warrior's wound. Simeon sees her, a young mom, in the temple, and he says something kind of bizarre to her. You're gonna receive a sword wound. Not just any sword wound, a sword wound from a battle sword. We see that Mary is also, uh, suffers the impact of war. She becomes a displaced person and has to flee into Egypt. And lastly, we're going to see a profound tragedy. Rachel weeping for her children. The death of the male children to and under in Bethlehem and the surrounding region. So, Mary as a warrior mom. We know that blessed among women in connection for us with fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. We see in Psalm 91, you shall tread upon the, the lion, which of course Peter uses as a symbol of the enemy, and the cobra, and the young lion, and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. And in this battle, in this profound battle, we're given victory through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, a warrior mom, connection to Deborah, who arose, connection to Jael, and connection to this powerful Hebrew word, Kael. It's connected to Old Testament people, places, and prophecies that are tied to Mary. It's connected to Ruth. We read in Ruth 3, 11, All the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous, or Kael, woman. Proverbs 31, Who can find a virtuous Kael woman? For her price is far above rubies. 
in Habakkuk 3, which we alluded to last day and we're going to see again today, that is where the person finds strength. They find strength in God, who is their Kael. And did you know that Ephrathah is mentioned a few times in Scripture, but there's a real strong connection with Ephrata and Ruth and Kael. It is an allusion, I think, to Mary. So we're going to see that in a second. So this word Kael is, is translated in a variety of ways, so it doesn't really pop up for us in the context of a warrior mom uh, as maybe it should. Sarah Fisher writes, over and over, Kael is represented as someone in God's army. It is translated as valiant warriors, capable men, strong and powerful, a great army, mighty soldiers. But what happens when the word Kael is used to describe a woman? Although valor, valor, strength, mighty warrior are the usual translations for this word, when it comes to women, the translation becomes warped. Now, Kael is a really important word in the Old Testament. And it's interesting to see how it's used in those two contexts. So we're going to see how it's used in the context of the only other person in Scripture that's recorded where an angel appears to them and says, the Lord is with you. So we have Mary and we have someone in the Old Testament. So who is the person in the Old Testament? Gideon, that's right. Um, uh, we've had some awesome evening lectures that um, get across the points that I'm trying to make much more clearly, so I appreciate that. And so here's another example. So it's Gideon, right? It's Gideon. So let's take a look. In Judges 6:12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor, you man of Kael. So the same context, an angel appears to Mary and says, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. So just like we were invited to compare Zacharias's response with Mary's response, I think the biblical echoes are inviting us to compare Gideon's response to Mary's response to see who really is, at this point in time, acting with Kael. So the angel appears, the Lord is with you. Now, we heard the rest of the story with Gideon last night, uh, but at, at this time, uh, Gideon is not acting with Kael. He says, the Lord isn't with us. If the Lord was with us, we wouldn't be oppressed. He says, I can't save Israel. He says, don't leave me. He says, show me a sign. And of course, he ends up asking for a bunch of signs. So compare that to Mary's response when the angel appears and says, the Lord is with you. She says, how will this happen? She says, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. And she says, let it happen as you say. So who is the person of valor in this situation? Who is the person acting with Kael? It's the maidservant of the Lord. So, a warrior's wound. So, in Luke 2, 34, we read that when they went to the temple, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And, and the disciples' literal New Testament captures the emphasis here. Indeed, a sword will pierce the soul of you yourself. Okay, let's take a step back. What a bizarre thing to say to a young mom. But that's what he says. And he uses not just any word for sword. He doesn't, he doesn't use mycara. He uses romphea which is a word that's not used too often in scripture, and it means a specific kind of sword. This is what it looks like. A sword exclusively used for war. So early on in Mary's life as a mom, she knows that she's going to be wounded as a warrior. So 
So, Mary returns to Nazareth. We read in Luke 1, Mary remained with her, that is Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her house. And Matthew 1, we read, Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So, I think we can infer found with child, she was visibly pregnant. There's no mention of Mary's family. And again, the, the narrative is, uh, gives us the sense that Mary is uh, without those kind of familial supports. Given the need for divine revelation to Joseph, it seems clear that Mary was silent in the face of her pregnancy. Now, here Mary is going to teach us an incredibly powerful lesson, and it's a lesson that I struggle to learn. And here's the lesson. Sometimes we fight the best when we're silent and we let the God take up our cause. That's what she does. She's silent. She fights this battle by trusting God completely. In Exodus, we read, the Lord will fight for you and you only have to be silent. I think this was a lesson her son learned, right? In Isaiah 53, so a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. I need to learn this lesson over and over again in my life. That the Lord will fight my battles if I trust in him and remain silent. Now, Joseph, we read being her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, so, Joseph is a just man, he's a good man, he's a thoughtful man, but he's upset. That word thought is a word indicating strong emotion. A helps word studies say, says of it that it means in a passionate frame of mind, easily agitated, quickly moved by strong provoking impulses. So Joseph was upset, understandably so. And yet, despite him being upset, he acts in a way uh, that shows how just he is. He doesn't want to make Mary a public example. And that word is only used twice in the, in the New Testament. And the only other time it's used is in Hebrews 6, 6, where it talks about uh, crucifying for themselves the Son of God and publicly disgracing him. So, Joseph feels like he must act, and although he is upset, he seeks the best outcome for Mary, a woman he must have believed to have been unfaithful to him. But there's divine intervention. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, you, to, take to you Mary, your wife. So, it's a dream. It's not in person, like with Zacharias and Mary. And Mary was fearlessly going forward in silence while Joseph was afraid. So, Joseph was afraid. What was he afraid of? He was afraid of what others would think of him. He was afraid he couldn't trust Mary. So, what helped... Joseph act with Kael. What helped him conquer his fear? Well, what does the angel say to him? The angel says, remember who you are. You're the son of David. God has work for you to do. And believe that God will fulfill his promises. We read in Matthew 1, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from his, their sins. This is the answer to our fears, isn't it? To remember who we are. To remember that God has chosen us. God has chosen us to be his children that we are precious in his sight. And the answer to fear is to remember that God has work for us to do right here, right now. I, 
like, like many folks, um, probably, I've struggled with depression from time to time in my life. And it's different for every person. But I find one of the things that works for me is to focus on the work that God has in front of me. Again, I know it's very individual for folks, but I know that's something that's really worked for me. So what conquers fear? Remembering who we are, remembering that God has work for us to do, and believing that God will fulfill his promises. That the current state is not the future state. That God has plans for us. And they're marvelous. So Joseph conquers his fear with the uh, exhortation of the dream. So being roused from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. Now imagine Joseph and Mary's next conversation. The understanding of what was in front of them as a team. I'm going to stop for a second. Do you remember the conversation that you had when you're with your spouse when you found out you were going to have your first child? Do you remember? I remember. I don't know if it was like this for you, but for Kathy and I, it was like the waves of responsibility started to wash over us. So multiply that by X when you realize the job that Mary and Joseph had, the responsibility that they had. Took to him his wife. So what was the wedding ceremony like? Was it the week-long, joyous community celebration that we read about in John 2? No. It's not recorded, but we can certainly infer that it was quick. And it was not the celebration that Mary had dreamed of. So through this adversity, Joseph and Mary become a team. They deal effectively with family and community. They keep the good news of Messiah quiet in fear of Herod. Their next task, Jesus should be born in Bethlehem. How do we make that happen? We know from Matthew 2 that it was widely understood that Micah uh, meant that Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. So this, if we think about that, it's kind of interesting to, to see how couched the language of war is in that prophecy of Micah 5. So if you take a look at Micah 5, it says, Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the, the time that she who is in labor has given birth. So this prophecy of, of, the, of the birth in Bethlehem, there's this interesting juxtaposition of warlike language with the language of giving birth, again suggestive of a warrior mom. Now, was the census requirement an answer to their prayers? Were they thinking, how are we going to make this happen? Should we move? What should we do? And so Mary sees how God used the Roman authorities to fulfill prophecy. And sadly, she's going to see this both at the beginning and at the end of Jesus' life. So we take a look at that in Micah 5. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah. And, and you see in, in front of us here that juxtaposition I was talking about, the kind of martial language. And it's even more pronounced in, in uh, chapter 4 that leads up to this. So we see the language of wars and warriors that surrounds the prophecy of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. 
So they decide um, to fulfill the requirements of the census and they go south to Bethlehem. So how did they end up in the, the north, in Galilee? Well, in 80 BC, Alexander Janaeus sent thousands of Judeans north to settle in Galilee. Therefore, it seems likely that Mary and Joseph would have went in a group whose grandparents were moved from Judea to Galilee uh, to fulfill the requirements of the census. They're keeping their secret um, to ensure that Jesus is safe from Herod. And, and in that, the gospel narratives continue to evoke a sense that Mary and Joseph were alone. So they weren't the only ones that would have been complying with the census. There would have been a, a large group of folks who would have had to do the same thing. Now, it's interesting, this journey. So whenever you make journeys um, to familiar destinations, the flood of memories comes back to you, right? So Mary is making this journey yet again from Nazareth to the south. So think about it. So for many, many years, um, Sister Kath and I drove from Guelph to Great Lakes Bible School in Sheboygan with our kids and uh, with Sister Mary. Uh, yeah, Sister Kathy said we put, the, we put her on top of the van like a granny in the Beverly Hillbillies. That's not true. It's not true. But in each of those journeys, things happen, right? And when you, when you think about that, all these, all these memories come up, all these family stories. And, and you think, as they made this trip back and forth, as Mary went down to fulfill the requirements of the census with Joseph, was she thinking about the journey that she had just made to Elizabeth and thinking about how she's a different person now? Is she thinking about all those things I was worried about? God is taken care of. I was worried about Joseph. Things are great now. I was worried about these other things, and God is taking care of them. The prophecy in Micah is strongly connected to a, a woman, a handmaid, who acted with Kael, Bethlehem Ephrathah. As Mary reflected on those things and the Micah prophecy that was so well understood to be a prophecy of, of where Messiah would be born, she would have been encouraged by the example of Ruth. Again, there's so many connections with Mary and Ruth. We read in Ruth, May the Lord make this woman who entereth thy house like Rachel and Leah, who built the house of Israel, and may she be an example of Kael. Where? And Ephrathah. So as Mary is casting her mind back to all the things that happened in Ephrathah, all the examples from which she could draw strength, she's connecting to the Lord's handmaid Ruth, of whom the community says, may the Lord make this woman that is Ruth, like Rachel and Leah, who built the house of Israel, and may she be an example of Kael. So as Mary's making her way to that spot, perhaps she's thinking that she too, praying that she too will be an example of Kael in Ephrathah. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, there's no mention of others assisting in the birth, and of course there's, you know, a whole bunch of fantastical uh, explanations as to why that is, uh, which don't seem to make sense for me, because if we're talking about fulfilling Genesis 3, then we would have been fulfilling Genesis 3 uh, in terms of Mary's struggles in giving birth. Is this how Mary imagined giving birth to her firstborn? We're gonna talk about um, the manger uh, in a little while, but is this how she imagined giving birth to her firstborn? It's interesting, isn't it, that the narrative really suggests that it's just Joseph and Mary when the family would have been close by, Elizabeth would have been close by, um, and they would have traveled south with other uh, distantly related folks but there's no mention of others assisting in the birth. 
Is this how Mary imagined giving birth to her firstborn? So Mary and Joseph are confronted with the reality and the enormity of their task. Again, think of your first child. I can remember, you know, Braden's 35 now, but I can remember taking him home from the hospital. The enormity just sinks in of the blessing with which you've been blessed. And again, multiply it by X in terms of Mary and Joseph. They also have the stress of that Herod can't find out. Herod, this famously paranoid psychopath, must not find out. So they laid him in a manger because there was no room for them. Now, we know that this is an unusual thing because the manger was so unusual as a location that it was used as a sign for the shepherds. We read in Luke 2.12, and this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. So there's an interesting echo that comes up. Mary's thoughts would have inevitably gone to Habakkuk and confirmation that God is her strength. Because one of the few times that word manger is used in the Old, in the Old Testament Septuagint is in Habakkuk 3. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, and that word in the Septuagint is the same word used here, manger. It's kind of a rare word. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We know that rejoicing was a key part of, of Mary's song. And why is she going to do that? Because the Lord is my Kael. The Lord is my Kael. As she was there in the manger, did Mary reflect on this and how that she was being made strong because the Lord is her strength? Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child, and all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. Hmm. So the shepherds show up. Now, the shepherds widely publicized Jesus' messianic birth. Now, Eidersheim suggests that this was a special group of shepherds. It was a, a bunch of shepherds that were in, in charge of the flock that would be used in the temple sacrifices. So they would naturally be going back and forth between this area and the temple, you know, driving the, the flock up and then going back and then driving the flock up. So they would have lots of connections. And so that's how they were able to widely publicize the fact that this was... Um, the child who had been born. So word seems to have reached faithful people, but and this is the, the power of God, right? But it didn't reach Herod until outsiders from the east came looking for the one born king of the Jews. So you can imagine the tension that this would have created in Joseph and Mary. We're trying to keep this as quiet as possible because Herod's a paranoid psychopath, and yet it's being made widely known. So we're told Mary's reaction to this, to the shepherds. It said, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So this word kept literally means preserved. And a similar use occurs in the Septuagint in Daniel, in Daniel 9. It's his response to the vision of the four beasts. We read in verse 28, as for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Pondered. It, this word literally means to throw two things together. So it means to consider conflicting ideas. So I think Mary was reflecting on how she was to keep Jesus safe in light of these two things. So should we keep Jesus birth as quiet as possible because Herod is a, a vengeful psychopath. But divine intervention was publicizing Jesus' birth. So I think Mary was reflecting on how do we navigate the tension between those two seemingly opposed things. So their next step 
is they were scrupulous in their observance of the law. They performed all things according to the law of the Lord. Joseph and Mary were quite clear about that. But to do that, Joseph and Mary had to go to Jerusalem, which was Herod's backyard. And to do that was an act of courage and faith. So if you see the, the map of Jerusalem up there, on the right-hand side, of course, is the temple, and the left-hand side circled is Herod's palace. So to fulfill the requirements of the law, they were literally having to go up right under Herod's nose, um, understandably apprehensive about that. But they were kept safe. And they have this um, incredible interaction with two people in the temple courts. And the first one is, of course, Simeon. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the th thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Isn't it interesting? Simeon blesses both Joseph and Mary, but he only talks to Mary. He only talks to Mary. Mary had anticipated this rising and falling, right? She had anticipated it in her song, where she sang, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. So that's not surprising to her. It's also not surprising that perhaps Simeon confirms not only Mary's hopes, but her fears. Her son will provide salvation, but will face many painful challenges that she too will share. And then we have Anna, a prophetess, who did not depart from the temple. She gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. So again, prophetess, the only time that word is used in the Old Testament Septuagint is Miriam, Deborah, and Huldah. Again, kind of connections with those folks that have been so connected to Mary. We know that Anna was a fixture at the temple, and I wonder if she and Mary had an existing relationship through Elizabeth. Um, that's pure speculation, but if, if Anna was literally always at the temple, and Elizabeth would, of course, naturally go up, um, naturally bring Mary when Mary was visiting, you wonder if they interacted. We see that Anna's bold and re repeated proclamation of Jesus as Christ would have strengthened Mary. And it's interesting, Herod controlled the high priests, however, none of them were made aware, oh, sorry, none of them made Herod aware of Jesus' birth. Which is, which is incredibly powerful, I think, that Herod exercised this really rigid control over the priestly class, and they would have been aware of what happened from the shepherds. They would have been aware of what happened from Simeon. They would have been aware of what happened with Anna, and yet they keep it from Herod. So let's recap. Mary as a warrior mom. The allusions to Deborah, the allusions to Jael, the allusions to Kael, the warrior's wound. Now, there are two final components that we're going to explore today. And admittedly, these are very painful. And I will confess, I don't know exactly why, but again, so much of our life, we don't know why. We don't know what the purpose is. We won't know until God's grace in the kingdom. But here we go with the final two components. The casualties of war. We're going to see Mary, like Rachel, weeping for her children. And the impact of war. Mary, Joseph, and Jesus being displaced persons. So Herod finally acts. What Joseph and Mary feared finally happens. It took outsiders to make Herod aware of this new threat. It was widely understood that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. The men from the east visit, worship, and leave gifts. An angel appears to Joseph in a dream and directs the family to Egypt. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus become displaced persons, refugees from war. They embodied, I think, in this adversity, the kind of sentiment that the writer to the Hebrews captures in Hebrews 11. 
They saw them from a distance and greeted them. They acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the land. So Joseph and, and Mary head out to Egypt, recognizing that God would keep them safe there. So what does Herod do? In Matthew 2, we read, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all her regions, who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had determined from the wise men. You know, brothers and sisters and friends, I've read this passage a zillion times. And it never hit me until I really started thinking about it. What an unspeakable tragedy. You know, Brother Thomas writes that in the war divinely instituted between the seeds of the serpent and the woman, there would be great loss of life. And this is certainly an example of tragic loss of life. We read in Matthew 2, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. We see that close to Ephrathah, Bethlehem, Rachel dies in childbirth. And David Flesser writes, In Matthew, Rachel is a symbolic figure for the suffering mother, in this case, the suffering Jewish mother. A voice heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children because they, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. We see the connection, too, with other folks that are connected to Mary. Deborah, you know, De the palm of Deborah was between Bethel and Ramah. Hannah, that's where Hannah lived. Hannah lived in Ramah. And so we have an insight into Mary's thoughts and feelings about the murder of so many children. You know, how can we understand the impact on Bethlehem, on Mary as a mother who knew these families? You know, we, we know that she had probably lived in that area for two years. She knew the kids, she knew their names. She knew the moms. Like you think of the relationships that you develop with young moms and dads when your kids are the same age. You're thrown together, right? You're thrown together and it's a safe space where you're like, I don't know what to do either. <laughs> but you develop those intense relationships. So Mary knew these families. How can we understand this? So, you know, a psychopath kills a community's children. So the only thing that I could think of that would give us some flavor of what Mary was going through was a tragic event that recently happened. Do you folks recognize those pictures? Yeah, those are the pictures of the school shooting in Uvalde, the victims. And that unspeakable tragedy, also committed by a psychopath, gives us some sense of what Mary was going through. She knew the children, she knew their families, she knew their mothers, and a sword passed through Mary deeply on that day. And we know that God feels these things like a mother as well. In Isaiah 49, could a mother forget a child who nurses at her breast? Could she fail to love an infant who came from her own body? Even if a mother could forget, I will never forget you. Our God understands the pain of a mother who has lost her child. And I wonder if the murder of the children was in Jesus and Mary's mind during his ministry, because his ministry is remarkably focused on children. So focused that the disciples sought to rebuke him about it, right? We read in Luke 18, 
Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called to them and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. There's countless healings of children, right? There's the nobleman's son, there's the centurion's boy, there's Jairus' daughter, there's the widow of Nain's son, there's a Syrophoenician, women, uh, Syrophoenician woman's daughter. I mean, talk about a warrior mom, that Syrophoenician woman was not going to let up. She was not going to give up. So I wonder if Mary especially, when she heard and saw and witnessed the healing of children, thought about the weeping in Rama. But in spite of this unspeakable, unspeakable tragedy and, and not understanding really all of it, as we won't until through God's grace we're in the kingdom, one thing is, is sure, that warrior moms never give up. Mary doesn't give up. She renews her war on a new battleground in Egypt. Warrior moms don't give up. And in our community, warrior moms don't give up. And when I say mom, I mean, as we talked about yesterday, not just biological moms, but all those who are mothers in Christ that engage in those mentoring relationships throughout the life of people. Again, in Ephesians 6, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. The warrior moms in our ecclesias will never give up. Like Mary, they will continue the battle. And in fact, the warrior moms in our ecclesias will continue the battle until they see, by God's grace, their children in the kingdom. And honestly, I think of the example that, that my wife Kathy sets. With our four kids. You know, there's a great song by Laurie McKenna called The Mother Never Rests. And it really captures the thing that you never stop worrying about your kids, whether they're 3 or 13 or 33 or 73. And really the example of, of Kathy and Mary and other people that I know well they never give up. They're always, always praying for their kids and their grandkids. So let's stop and take a minute and express our thanks for the example of Mary being a warrior mom. And let's stop and give thanks for the example of so many warrior moms in our ecclesia. Next day, God willing, we're going to talk about Mary as a disciple.